This is Ask the Experts. Here's Karen Bhatia. I am Karen Bhatia. This is Ask the Experts. Thank you so much for joining me. We are presented by DraftKings. It's Canelo Triple G Three Fight Week. We're going to get you ready for that. And we're coming off the heels of UFC 279. So we're going to recap that event. First up, it's OG Shawnee Mack. He is the MMA journalist for Full Send, and he is going to be forever linked with Nate Diaz. Of course, he got the Stockton slap backstage. We're going to talk about that. We're going to break down Diaz versus Ferguson. We're going to talk about what's next for Nate Diaz. And then it is Canelo Triple G3, the trilogy. It's finally happening, and I'm going to be speaking to the boxing historian, boxing writer, Thomas Hauser. We're going to get you ready for that historic trilogy event that's coming up this weekend. So without further ado, let's get to my first guest, OG Shawnee Mack. I am Karan Bhatia, joined by the OG, OG Shawnee Mack. You know him from Full Send. He's the MMA journalist over there, and you've been in this game for a long time. That's why they call you OG. How are you doing, my friend? Hey, I'm good, brother. Listen, Full Send MMA is new to the scene, so they think we're casuals. But man, I've been following this for a minute. You know what I'm saying? Don't get it twisted. Of course, that's why that's why you're the OG. And I, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your journey and joining Full Send and all of that. But let's start with UFC 279. Uh, I'm sure you saw everything that that came together. Obviously, it was supposed to be Nate Diaz versus Hamza Chemaev. We know what happened. The last minute shuffle. I have never seen anything like that. You've you've been covering MMA for a long time. Have you ever seen anything like that where a card gets shuffled like that and comes together and changes the day of a weigh-in? I've been telling multiple people the same thing that asked me this question, bro. And I'm like, I'm like, man, I think it was the it was the Friday for the weigh-ins, I guess, when it was all, you know, kind of scrambling. I woke up that morning and I did not leave my laptop or like my my phone. I had to have my phone charged from, you know, about 8 a.m. in the morning till shit, man. Basically until the time Dana went online and said, okay, this is the new card. It was, it was absolutely hectic. It was like five or six straight hours of holy fuck. I got to refresh my Twitter feed. Um, I got to refresh Instagram. You know what I mean? I don't even have Twitter. So I just go on there as like a, as like a guest, like I'll type in Twitter search in Google and I'm just consistently refreshing UFC 279. It was the most hectic day as far as like media coverage wise that I've ever seen or been a part of because man, you've got everyone in your DMS going, you know, I need an update. I need an update. What's going on this side. I'm like, man, I, I'm asking myself the same thing, you know, <laughs> It was it was crazy how it played out. Um, it actually made for some pretty interesting fights. Um, and, and of course, I want to ask you about the main event. But let's let's talk about Chimaev. He was a man possessed, as he as he tends to be. Um, he took out Kevin Holland, and then he did the full heel turn in the post fight interview. Um, Joe Rogan, of course, did his job and asked about the weight issues. Uh, Chimaev said it was, it was a doctor who told him not to cut weight. We're, we're not exactly sure, uh, what happened there. W what did you think of Chimaev's performance? And then maybe more importantly, his future in this sport in terms of cutting weight and things like that. Yeah. So I, like my original opinion on it was like, if a doctor tells you to stop cutting weight, that's probably the explanation for why he weighed in so heavy the next day. But then the next day, uh, it was either the next day or the day after. I can't remember who I was talking to, but they were like, bro, he shouldn't even have got to that point. You know, he should have already been cutting to not have to make that point. You know, if, if you're, if you're getting to that point where a doctor's cutting you off, what are you doing? You know, why aren't you down a little bit more? So you don't have to get to that point. Um, and then I heard, I heard another theory like, bro, he doesn't even look drained on the scale, you know, like he looked like he was pretty, pretty thick, pretty healthy on the scale. So they're like, you know, if he was really, really trying to cut, then he would have looked like shit on the scale. Like you don't recover that quickly overnight type deal. So I don't know. I'm still flip flopping back and forth on what to think of that whole scenario. I do think he should fight at probably 185. I mean, everybody gets one. I feel like everybody gets one bad weight miss, but 
that was a bad one on that scale to do that and to have to rearrange the whole card. I mean, I understand, like I say, I understand it was a doctor type deal, but I would, I'd like to see him at 85 and I would love to see that fight with Paulo Costa. Let's see if that happens and, and what uh, happens with his career, but it's, it's certainly entertaining to see the heel turn uh, from him. Um, and, and it certainly matches his style in the octagon. Wanted to of course ask you about the main event. Nate Diaz versus Tony Ferguson. That's the fight we ended up getting. Um, two legends in the game, two of the toughest people on, on planet Earth, in my opinion. Um, I thought it was a really interesting fight. Of course, Nate ended uh, the fight with this submission win. And Nate with the UFC has had a love-hate relationship. It sounds like, based on the post-fight interview, he wants to maybe go into boxing next. Uh, of course, I'm sure Jake Paul heard that and is thinking about that maybe as a future opponent. Um, and the reason I say that is because Nate said Conor McGregor tried it and couldn't do it. And that makes me think of boxing because Conor obviously uh, fought Floyd Mayweather. Um, what do you think Nate Diaz is going to do next in his career? Listen, I am 1000% here for Nate Diaz versus Jake Paul. You know what I mean? Obviously, Jake's got a big fight on the 29th against Anderson Silva. That is a guy you can not overlook by any means. I don't care if he's 47. I don't care if he's 30, 37. You know what I mean? As long as the guy's not fucking 60 years old, that's a guy that you can never overlook. But Jake Paul versus Nate Diaz, the, the amount of press and the amount of hype and the amount of content we're going to get out of that fight, holy shit. Like, you, you're going to get the Nick Diaz army and then you're going to get all of Jake Paul's homies like, Logan and Jay Leon love. And you know what I mean? Absolutely incredible content, you know? So how, how can you not, how can you not want that fight for Nate Diaz? If he doesn't, if he doesn't get that fight, well, he's, he's starting his new promotion, right? I think it's real fights. Um, so maybe he just puts on the promoter hat and just pumps out fights for a while and, you know, just, just kicks it. You know, which I would love to. I love to see when guys make it out of the game successfully and they don't have to fight anymore because there's too many guys right now in combat sports that they just haven't made enough money throughout their career and they still have to fight even though they shouldn't be in there. And I hate seeing that. So, yeah, either either the Jake Paul fight or, man, just put the promoter hat on and just chill. And we have to give credit to Jake Paul for taking on the legend in Anderson Silva. A lot of people called for Paul uh, versus Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. because he's a younger guy, a uh, big guy still in his prime, but Silva just beat Chavez Jr. So it, it is, uh, it, I, I think it's a really interesting matchup. We'll see what happens there. We talked about Nate Diaz uh, getting the win and what might be next. Of course, your career will probably be forever linked with Nate Diaz with the incident that of course happened backstage, you, you were interviewing him um, for anyone who hasn't seen it, which I'm sure is not many people. I'm sure everyone's seen it at this point. Um, you were interviewing Nate Diaz and he was upset about some tweets uh, that full send put out and he gave you the Stockton slap. Um, it, it's been some time since the incident happened. Uh, when you look back now, I mean, how do you, how do you assess the incident that happened? Uh, you getting slapped by Nate Diaz. So here's the thing, like, I got into this game originally by starting an Instagram account. And this was like two years ago, way, way, way back. And I thought, how can I be different? How can I do something to get a little bit of a start, you know, that nobody's doing? So what I originally started doing was I would take actual interview clips and I would cut them up and I would take the fighter's answers. And then I would just write like a stupid question ahead of it, you know, so I would make it like a joke interview. And I, I started by clipping these together on my cell phone and just DMing them to fighters. And for whatever reason, it started catching on and, and people got got into it. Um, I think I at one point I had like 200 followers and I made this video of like old John Jones highlights where he's like hitting pads and shit. And I dubbed like when he was hitting the pads, I dubbed over like little girl, like karate sounds, you know, Hi type thing. Right. And that shit ended up on his Twitter when I had like 200 followers. So I was like, Oh shit, I might, I might be onto something here. Right. And then I saw, I saw how big MMA memes were getting and like, I love a good meme. You know what I mean? I, I could fuck with a good meme. So then that's how I started blowing up. You know, I, I started making MMA memes. I was a meme page 
Um, and I built a pretty sufficient following there. And then one day somebody was like, bro, do you want to do interviews? You should do it. Long story short, that's how I got started in interviews. But then I would get DMs and people would be like, bro, the shit might catch up to you one day when you're going to interview fighters. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, it probably is, but charge it to the game. You know what I mean? If it happens, it happens. And there's nothing I can do about it because hey, I probably deserve it. You know, it's fighting is a very, very sensitive subject. And some people are cool with memes. Like Kamara Usman just put a meme on his page the other day where he's like getting kicked in the head and like Joe Rogan's in there with the microphone, you know? So like, Certain fighters are cool with it, but then there's certain camps you don't fuck with. So for for Diaz to do that, bro, it, it was a blessing and a curse because you get a lot of shitty, like real shitty DMs from people that just like you'll never see in person. But one thing you got to learn is just ignore the DMs in the comments because you'll fucking drive yourself crazy. And I was reading a couple to start, you know what I mean? I was like, ah, oh, fuck, you know what I mean? You, you guys are assholes, you know, fuck you guys. You don't know me. But then I was like, I started looking at it from a different perspective, you know, like here's an example. I was at the, the New York, New York, and I was doing an interview with D-Rod um, for his fight against the leech. And uh, we're doing an interview and this kid kind of walks over towards us and he's staring at us and he's, he's kind of looking at me and I'm like, what's that, man? He's like, he's like, you, you're the guy, right? You, you're the guy that Diaz slapped. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, man, that's me. It's cool. You know, he's like, he's like, man, can I get a picture? And this whole time D rod is standing right beside me and he's fucking pissing himself laughing. And I'm like, you don't want a picture with this guy. And this kid looks at me and like, God bless him. Cause he, he was, he didn't mean anything by it, but he's like, he's like, who's that guy? And I'm like, holy shit, man. Cause it just showed me the different generations that are kind of coming into MMA, like the people that followed full send and stuff. But I was like, bro, that's D rod. Like he's fighting the leech. He's part of the top three fights on this card. So this kid came and took a picture with me and he got a picture with D rod. And I'm like, listen, I appreciate you taking the picture, but, remember who that fucking guy is because that guy is a stud you know what i mean so yeah it's been a total blessing and a curse but i think it's been more of a blessing than anything to be honest i mean who who in their mma career there's very few of us that can say we got the honor of the the stockton slap since you were slapped by nate diaz has there been any further communication interaction what's your relationship with, with nate diaz now no i just i just leave their camp alone bro you know what i mean i, I it is what it is. Um, I know the Nelk boys are super tight with them, so I'm sure I'm sure it'll happen one day. Um, I've been back and forth in the DMs with Jake Shields. Jake Shields is super cool. Um, he was doing some some training with Costa at the PI, so I kind of reached out back then and super cool. But no, man, I'm just I'm just gonna do my thing. If that interview comes together one day, cool. But you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna poke the bear. You know, I'm not gonna force things. Speaking of poking the bear. Uh, you know, your job as an MMA journalist sometimes requires asking the tough question or even getting into it with fighters, maybe pushing back. You had the situation with Luke Rockhold um, recently, and, and I know that he was unhappy with, with some of your work and, and you had to stand up for yourself. Um, how did how did that situation go down and, and did it resolve itself in any way? Man, some people, like I said, some people, the OGs in the game, they they don't like new people coming up in the game. and. Like what had happened was I had done an interview with Cheeto Vera in San Diego before the interview took place. I said this at the weigh-ins as well. We were in San Diego. Cheeto Vera is a fun guy. OG is apparently so unaware of what's going on. You know what I mean? Unaware of what could offend people, you know? And I had bought these stupid Nacho Libre masks because we were in a market in San Diego and I was like, fuck, what can I do to make the interview fun with Cheeto? You know, he's a, he's a good guy like that. So I messaged his manager, Jason House, who's a good buddy of mine. I was like, Jason, I'm going to bring these to the interview. Are you cool if I do this with Cheeto? He says, yeah, no problem. You know what I mean? Um, obviously, Cheeto and I do the interview, and people can say what they want about, oh, he looked awkward and this and that. Bro, I interviewed Cheeto post-fight after he beat Dominic Cruz. Cheeto says, bro, if I had a problem with it, I wouldn't fucking be doing this interview with you right now. You know what I mean? So then um, what's crazy was 
I had gone to that media day where Luke Rockhold was going to be and people had sent me articles the day before, I guess he had gone on some, some show. Um, and he had talked about the Nelk boys, like somebody had asked him about the Nelk boys and he had said on the show, like, I don't know why we're letting these guys in our, our, you know, in MMA and blah, blah, blah. And they're, they're just not good for it. Um, there's some other things that, that probably won't come out. I feel like between Nelk and like full send and Luke Rockhold. Um, but that's, you know, it's just something I don't, don't even need to bother with. So I went into that media day and seeing what he had said the day before going like, man, I'm probably the, the link between the Nelk boys and Luke Rockhold right now. So I went in there going, you know what, if he comes at me, he comes at me. Right. So I don't know. It was just a very weird situation. Like for him to try to flip the narrative like that on me. Um, I don't know. You know what I mean? If you, if you have a little bit of, uh, I don't want to say common sense, but like you can see, you know, cause that interview was up for like a week or 10 days and there had been nothing but positive responses on that interview. Everybody thought it was just a joke in which, it was intended to be, it was in no way intended to be anything referring to culture. You know what I mean? Um, so for the way that that got flipped, I was like, come on, man. But then, but then I had to flip it on them, you know, going back to like my meme days and me being kind of quick with it. Um, the whole do your homework thing. So the next day we went to the, to the dollar store and I bought a stupid pair of glasses and I bought a little notepad and I wrote OG's homework on it. And I showed up to the weigh-ins with my shirt tucked in and these stupid glasses on. Uh, and, uh, you know, I played up the whole do your homework thing. And I saw, <laughs> I literally saw Cheeto at the weigh-ins that day. He was with Jason Perillo and I had met Jason Perillo the night I'd interviewed Cheeto. Super cool guy. Nothing but good things to say about Jason Perillo. And I'm, you know, good relationship there. So I was like, Hey Jason, like, can I, can I talk to Cheeto? And he's like, Oh shit. Cause he just remembered what happened. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll bring you over. So I go over to Cheeto. Same thing. Zero issues at all. I'm in there with my stupid glasses and my shirt tucked <laughs> in and my notepad, my arms around Cheeto and we take a picture together. So you know what I mean? If there was really an issue, Cheeto would have been like, fuck you, man. I don't want to do this. So it's going to happen, bro. It, it happens in the industry and it's very, it, I don't know if it's, common for that to happen in two months of being in the game but <laughs> <laughs> um i got thick skin man you know i knew what i was getting into when i when i got into this speaking of doing your homework uh you've you've been at all of these events you've put in your time and i wanted to chat with you a little bit about your journey and, and how you got to this point i know that you said at one point you had to move back home with your parents because you wanted to pursue your dream and, and you created your own audience. And, and obviously now you're on the, the full send platform. Um, how, how would you describe your journey that, that you've been through to get here? Absolutely insane. Like it all started UFC 245 with my homie. Um, we've been MMA fans since we were like 14, 15 years old. You know what I mean? Back in the Chuck Tito days, early, early UFC days, um, back when they were in like double digits, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, man, I was, I was working construction, construction at the time. Yeah. I was, uh, you know, hammering nails and fucking working the nine to five grinding, working construction five days a week, sometimes six days a week to get by. I was, um, a year away from finishing my carpentry apprenticeship. Um, and I was just doing it because I thought it was what I was supposed to do. You know, um, I come from a blue collar background where everybody just had decent enough paying jobs to get by so i was like fuck you know i'll go to school i'll do the the apprenticeship thing and i'll work doing carpentry and make a decent enough living you know but then i just remembered certain days when i'd be working in the piss and rain or like on the roof in the heat just fucking hating my life you know hating my life going man you can't do this shit for the rest of your life because your body starts to break down you have some real fucking miserable days so we went to UFC 245, me and a buddy, and we ended up going to a jiu-jitsu event on like a Thursday or a Wednesday. It was Quintet Ultra. 
super like i don't know if it was hush hush event but there was just not a lot of people there but it was at the the red rock hotel where all the fighters were staying for ufc 245 so everybody fucking showed up to watch the scrappling match and we were rubbing shoulders with like fighters media all night and the night ended and i looked at my body i'm like because we fit right in you know like we were just talking to them like they were our buddies and i was like bro, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do this. You know, I'm, I'm going to be here one day and I'm going to be interviewing these guys and my buddy being my buddy who's supported me since day one. Like you don't find too many buddies in your life that are really, really support you. So when I was on the independent grind, this guy that was there with me at 245, he was paying for my flights wow. to help me go get to these events. Yeah. And he looked at me that night and he said, oh, I know, I have no doubts. So from that point, it was, let's do this thing. We started an Instagram account like after that weekend. And then two years later, I get signed by the fucking Nelk boys. You know, I, this stuff doesn't happen. It, I tell people all the time, I'm like, bro, this, this literally does not happen. Once in a lifetime opportunity, but yeah. Shout out to my homie for, for supporting me because you always need that one guy that has your back, but it's absolutely insane. You had to get out of your comfort zone and, and doing the, you know, the path that you were supposed to be on. You had to put in your time. You've obviously found creative ways to engage with fighters. You've, you've cultivated those fighter relationships. So my final question for you would be, we, we talked about your journey and what you had to do to get here. Would you have any advice to, to people who are maybe listening to this on their own journey, whether they want to get into MMA journalism or anything else, right? It's hard to take that first step and to continue and, and to, uh, and to go for it. Right. So what would be your advice to people? Man, the biggest thing is you got to be all in, you got to be all in and you really, really got to love what you're doing. Um, I started this thing as a fan. I will always be a fan of the sport. Like even today, um, I'm probably just going to head over to MGM and watch the triple G and Canelo fight or Canelo press conference, just as a fan, just to be able to take that in, you know, because we've been doing media for damn, like two months straight back and forth on the road. So I just want to be able to go and see something as a fan. Um, I'll, I'll probably bring my camera just in case, you know, but my, my biggest advice is, yeah, you got to really, really love what you're doing because if you don't, you're not going to succeed. You know, if it feels like if it feels like a job and you're sitting there some days going, man, I really don't want to fucking do this. Then you shouldn't be doing it. Even on my worst days, I'll still be sitting there, you know, scrolling Instagram, talking to people about fights because I, I genuinely love this sport. So for anybody that wants to start, you got to be committed. And I think you got to flip the script a little bit. I, everybody always says that, Oh, you got to be different, this and that, you know, and it sounds super cliche, but that's how I started. Something as stupid as taking old interview clips and flipping them and putting joke questions over top. You know, I'm not doing that today, but it was a, a way for me to interact with fighters. And I was able to sort of piggyback off of that because one fighter would repost it or share it on their page. And now all the fighters that they train with were able to see that. And with social media, <clears throat> excuse me, social media being as accessible to, as it is, you can, I was able to click on the likes of that video and see what fighters liked that video. So then I would be like, okay. I'm going to reach out to this fighter now, you know? So yeah, effort, um, differentiate, excuse me, differenti differentiate yourself. God damn, it's too early for that. <laughs> um, and just, bro, just love what you're doing. You know, I'm sitting at, I'm sitting here in a hotel in Las Vegas right now. And for anybody on this phone that's in my DMs going like, fuck you, man. I'd be like, <laughs> Bro, I'm reading your I'm reading your fuck you message in a hotel in Las Vegas. So I think I'm doing OK, you know, can hear the passion in, in your voice and, and congratulations on everything you have achieved so far. And I'm sure you're going to keep going. OG Shawnee Mac, you can see his content on Full Send 
MMA. OG, thank you so much for the time, man. Enjoy the press conference today, and I hope to talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Shout out Full Send MMA on YouTube. Make sure you follow it. Full Send MMA on Instagram. And Curran, thank you so much for having me, man. It's a, it's a pleasure. And that was OG Shawnee Mack. Before we get to Thomas Hauser, here's a quick word from our sponsor, DraftKings. The NFL's opening week was action-packed, and it's just getting started. Get ready for week two of touchdowns. Big plays and even bigger wins with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. This week, new customers can bet just $5 on any football game and get $200 in free bets instantly. Want more action? Everyone can experience the thrill of DraftKings early win promotion. It's simple. This Sunday, bet on any NFL team to win. If your team leads by 10 at any point during the game, you get paid instantly, even if your team loses. That sounds like a great deal to me. You don't want to miss that. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code CURRAN, C-U. R-R-A-N, to get $200 in free bets instantly when you place a $5 bet on any football game. That's code CURRENT, only at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Be sure to use that promo code. We're getting you ready now for Canelo Triple G. Three. It's, of course, happening on Saturday, September 17th, and I will be speaking to the renowned boxing author, historian, Thomas Hauser. Karen Batia here with Thomas Hauser. We're at Tau downtown for the Canelo Triple G press conference. Thomas, how are you doing? I'm okay. Nice to be here. This is a massive fight, one of the biggest in boxing, if not the, the biggest. You're obviously a historian of boxing. You've seen some massive events. Where does this compare for, for this era compared to others? Like, is this the defining fight of, of this era? No, this is not the defining fight of the era. This is a very, very good fight. It's a little late. It should have happened a couple of years ago. Everybody understands that Gennady is 40 now. And at 40, unless you're Bernard Hopkins, you don't perform the way you did when you were 32 or 33. Uh, the assumption is that Canelo has gotten bigger and stronger since their last fight, and Gennady has gotten older and slower, and that's something you have to consider. Of course, one of the big problems with boxing is fights don't happen when they should. The first fight happened in 2017, second fight in 2018. Do you think that was a little bit part of Canelo's game plan in terms of trying to delay the trilogy fight so that Triple G would be older? No, no. I think that Canelo had other fish to fry uh, for whatever reason, whether it was monetary, having to do with belts, whatever. This just wasn't the right fight for him at that time. In terms of Canelo, he went up to 175. He lost against Babal. He's coming back down. Uh, we've seen fighters in the past when they do jump up in weight classes and, and come back down. It may not. Uh, it may affect them negatively. Do you do you expect to see anything negative for Canelo with the weight? I, I don't see that as being a negative. Obviously, the person that hurt the most was Roy Jones, who went up from 175 pounds to fight John Ruiz. But there's a big difference between going up from. 175 pounds to maybe 200 pounds he weighed on fight night and then coming down 25 pounds to doing what Canelo did here. So, no, I don't think that the weight is going to be an issue for Canelo. It could hurt Golovkin moving up to 168 for the first time, but I have to think that if Gennady's age... The fact that he does not have to struggle and beat up on his body to make weight at 160 for this fight is probably a plus. So I don't see the weight as being that big a factor. I do see the age as being a factor. It, it, it's personal for Canelo. He said that. He's made that public. He says he's going to knock, knock out by the mid-rounds. Golovkin is more of the gentleman. He hasn't engaged in that. How do you see this fight playing out? What, what, what do you think is going to happen? Every fight is personal. Yeah. Uh, whatever you feel of, before the fight, when somebody tries to punch you in the face, it gets very personal very quickly. My sense is that at this point, 
Canelo is stronger than Gennady. He, he's younger than Gennady. Uh, his skill level is uh, certainly at Gennady's skill level. So I think Canelo wins, but it won't be a walk in the park. Gennady will not go easily. There you have it, Thomas Hauser. I want to thank you so much for the time. Thank you. And that brings us to the end here. I want to thank my guests, of course, OG Shawnee Mack, breaking down Diaz versus Ferguson, UFC 279. Of course, remember, OG Shawnee Mack took the Stockton slap personally, so he knows a lot about Nate Diaz, and I appreciate him sharing his journey. And, of course, Thomas Hauser, boxing historian, boxing author. He's putting into perspective Canelo Triple G3, the trilogy fight, where it falls in history, the importance of this matchup, and, and he did just that. Get you ready for Saturday, September 17th. It's going down. Canelo versus Triple G3. It's on the zone pay-per-view. You, of course, don't want to miss that. I want to thank you so much for listening. For Ask the Experts, I am Karan Bhatia. Thank you for listening to Ask the Experts with Karan Bhatia. 